Hello again, everybody. This is Pastor Tony, and welcome to the fifth and final series in the Healing 101 course. And of course, we're wrapping this whole course up in this one final series here in talking about how to receive the healing that rightfully belongs to you because of the finished work of Jesus. And of course, if we're talking about receiving something from God, we have to talk about the subject of faith. Faith is such an important subject to God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And of course, we all know from Romans chapter 10, those who are born again, that you receive that initial new birth experience, getting in the door of salvation through faith. Well, it doesn't stop there. In fact, the Bible says that the just, the ones who are saved, shall live by their faith. God never intended for you to park your faith at the door uh, once you get born again and get in the door. He wants you to learn to live by this faith. And of course, if that's true, we need to learn everything we can about the subject of faith because that is always going to bring us the things that we need from the unseen realm of God over into the seen realm where we need it. And of course, we're talking about and emphasizing in this course the subject of healing. You can use this same uh, these same principles we're talking about right here for receiving anything from God, but we're going to kind of use it in context of receiving healing. Now, I want to go back over to some scripture we looked at in the last couple of lessons found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. And of course, this is following in context, this is following the incident of the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus, Peter, James, and John were on the Mount of Transfiguration. We went through that. They came down and there was some commotion going on around his disciples who were left down there. And Jesus walked up and said, you know, what are you talking to them about? Something obviously had happened. And they were in a debate or an argument with some uh, religious naysayers, I guess we could say. And then there's one that said in the crowd about that time, a father who had brought his son to Jesus' disciples while he was up on that mount. And he said, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that cast him into the fire and into the water. Uh, basically, I don't know what you'd want to call this. It's a spirit of infirmity. It was trying to destroy this boy. And of course, there was some healing involved there as well. But, you know, uh, his disciples had failed to be able to cast that spirit out. Well, Jesus said to him, or that man said to Jesus, he said, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Well, Jesus turned around, put it in his court, and basically said, all things are possible to him who believes. See, it's, uh, believing opens the door for God's supernatural ability, power, and resources to be administered and to manifest here in our life here on the earth to meet the needs, not only of ourselves, but through us to help meet the needs of other people. Well, you know, the man said, uh, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And we talked about that because he was having, he, he was responding in his heart to the grace statement that Jesus had just made him. Basically, it just wrote him out a blank check, signed it and said, here, whatever you can believe for, you can have. And that man said, I'm believing. In other words, in my heart, I am responding to that in faith. I'm believing for it. He said, help my unbelief. And he was having some trouble in his head. Just because of that lifelong experience with that demonic spirit, you know, in his boy. And trying everything in the world, probably, in desperation, to try to get his boy delivered. And, and failing on everything. So he was really having some trouble in his head. So he said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And of course, obviously he had enough faith. God, Jesus met him where he was and he cast that spirit out and his, he, got, he went home with what he came, came over there for. Let make a long story short. But right after that, there was a debriefing session with his disciples. You know, sometimes we need debriefing sessions with the Lord. I can tell you, we'll get a lot out of that. Well, you'll learn just as much from your mistakes and failures sometimes as your successes. But those disciples that couldn't cast that out, that was bugging them, I tell you, really bad. And, and so they came to Jesus, this is Matthew chapter 17, verse 19, and uh, asked him privately, why couldn't we cast that spirit out? Well, you know, if, if they had believed the like a lot of religious people teach in that traditional idea that you just never know what God's going to do, and 
you know, if he answers your prayer, then it was his will. If he doesn't, it, it won't. And, you know, you just, you know, healing's not always the will of God. Sometimes he withholds that from some people or another. You know, if they would have believed that, they, would, they wouldn't have been asking that question. They would have just accepted that cop out and just said, well, I guess it wasn't the Lord's will to heal. Well, Jesus came along and did cast that spirit out. So obviously it was God's will. And these disciples have been used in this before. You know, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus gave them authority to cast out spirits and heal the sick. And of course, they came back. This is Luke chapter 10. They came back with joy because even the uh, demonic spirits were subject uh, to them through his name. So obviously they were having success, you know, doing this before. But this one case right here, this one incident, uh, they, just, they just hit a wall and they could not cast that spirit out. It wasn't that their, uh, the name of Jesus wouldn't work or their authority wouldn't work. It wasn't that, you know, that this was just for professional divinity people only and that was just over their pay grade. <laughs> no, because Jesus responded this way in verse 20. Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. Now we talked about that in the last couple of lessons. He didn't say it's because you just didn't have enough faith. Because he goes on to say, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you would say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. So basically he said the same thing to his disciples that he said to that father of that child. Nothing is impossible. All things are possible to him who believes. So what was the problem here? Well, the problem was not that they had such small faith because that would that would be counteractive uh, 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 to what Jesus went on to say if you had faith as a mustard seed. In other words, you don't have to have big faith in order to do something big and believe for something big to manifest in your life. That, that would negate what Jesus said right there. So obviously he's not talking about, well, you just didn't have enough faith here. They had the faith. We have the faith. We have the faith of Jesus himself. So it's not a question of whether we have faith or not or enough faith to get it done. You know, we got to kind of get over that right there. The problem is the abundance of unbelief. And that abundance of unbelief working was negating and nullifying the faith that was in their heart. Now, what was that? Well, when that, you know, demonic spirit put on that song and dance dog and pony show, I like to say, you know, with that boy foaming at the mouth and becoming rigid and trying to throw him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. I mean, that demonic spirit put on a show and he was that that spirit was trying to intimidate them and it worked. And probably the crowd somewhere along the way turned on them, you know, and they started being moved by all these outward things that were going on, what they were seeing in this boy, uh, you know, when they were trying to cast that spirit out and the moans and the groans of the crowd and the murmurings that were going on in the crowd behind them. And they began to be moved off of their faith and unbelief entered in and just shut their faith down and kept it from growing up like a seed and producing a harvest there that day. Now, Again, we're talking about unbelief, but what we want to talk about the next couple of lessons or so is how to get rid of this unbelief. You know, we can't just ignore it. We can't just sweep it under the rug. And if you really want to eliminate unbelief in your life so that your faith is pure, just like that mustard seed we were talking about in the last couple of lessons, you know, Jesus specifically used the mustard seed, not only because of the size of it, but because of the purity of it. Because you can't just you can't crossbreed a, a mustard plant and and make it some kind of hybrid something or another. It can't be crossbred. And this is Jesus is really talking about not just the size but the purity of our faith. And that's really the emphasis right here. The problem was their their faith was corrupted. It was corrupted by a lot of unbelief and doubts. So how do we get rid of uh, doubts and unbelief? What, what can we do? Well, we need to go and find out what the root of unbelief and doubt is in our life. Once we find out where it's rooted, then we can uproot it. We can eliminate it in our life. And that's the good news. All of us can do this. It's not hard, but it does take diligence because we're just inundated. We've had life experiences. However old you are, you've had life experiences that are a lot, large part negative. You've experienced a lot of negative things in your life, and you probably didn't get the results that you had 
many times desire to hope for and sometimes believing for. And uh, so we got all of that going on and then we got just inundated. You know, the world system is all about unbelief and doubt. They don't really believe God at all. If you're gonna if you're gonna walk the walk of faith and you're gonna believe God for the impossible, you're gonna have to basically swim upstream, <laughs> and you're gonna have to go against the flow. And you can't be concerned about what everybody and, and all the crowd is saying, the social media is saying, and you're gonna get persecuted for this because you're gonna stand out like a heel thumb. All right. And people are gonna say, well, you know, what's wrong with them over there? They're a religious nut. Well, I'm neither one, neither a religious nut. It's kind of like grape nuts. You know, you ever have grape nuts here? And I'm not down in grape nuts, it's a great cereal. But the title of grape nuts, it's neither grapes nor nuts, okay? So I don't know where they get it. I'm neither religious, nor am I a nut. No, we're actually the one going the right direction. Everybody else is going the opposite direction in their doubts and unbelief. But where do we get, how do we get rid of, uproot and eliminate the unbelief in our life? Well, let's go over to the book of Genesis. And I promise you, we're not gonna go through every book of the Bible, all right? But we do wanna start over in the book of Genesis and see some things of what happened in the Garden of Eden. This is gonna give us some clues of how the enemy operates and how he subtly plants his uh, seeds of doubt and unbelief in our heart. But here in uh, Genesis chapter three, this is right after Adam and Eve were created. They were placed in the garden and it was absolutely perfect, pristine. It was, it was the very good state that God had created. It was the perfect will of God on the earth at that time. Only, only time you know uh, uh, that that was actually the case was for them. They were experiencing not only the perfect will of God inwardly, but the perfect will of God outwardly and what was going on around them. It was just nothing but the very goodness of God manifesting around them. And God had given them, he said, you can freely eat off of any tree of this garden here. He said, but there's one tree over there that you will not eat off of. For in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Actually, the Hebrew rendering of that says, in dying, you shall die. In dying spiritually, you will eventually die physically. And that was indeed the case with them. We won't go into all that. But uh, so God had given them a command not to eat off of that tree. Now you say, well, why did God put that thing in there? Why did God put that, that old bad tree in the middle of the garden? Well, first of all, it wasn't a bad tree. It was just a tree. God planted it there, but it was his tree. And God didn't want us learning about uh, the, he never actually intended for any of us to have an intimate experience or knowledge of evil at, at all. He wanted us just to know the very good that he had placed mankind in originally. But, and, and, you know, in order to, God gave all of us, mankind, uh, the right of free choice. But what good is free choice if you don't have a choice or, or you, you lack a choice? If everything's just good, and everything is just God, there is absolutely no choice. And so we can't truly love God if we don't have something, some alternative to love other than God. See, that's what God wants. He doesn't want forced, uh, you know, for, uh, some kind of a forced will in you. He's not going to manipulate and make you do anything. You know, a lot of our religious praying is that way. God just humbled me. Make me do this. Make me do that. God's not going to do that because he wants you to decide in your heart by your will to love him and to follow him and to choose his word and to value him and value the word of God. But that's all up to us. And so he gave him a choice. And of course, uh, Satan took advantage of that. Here in Genesis 3, 1, notice, and it says, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now notice he is subtly suggesting that God, he is really counteracting and, and coming against the integrity of God's word. He's actually subtly suggesting, Did God really say that? You know, did God really say, you shall not eat off of every tree of the garden. See, so he's wanting to see what kind of, where they are spiritually. 
And of course, she, she said, you know, to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the, free, uh, of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Well, that's not exactly what God said. And Satan all of a sudden took a note of that. He said, you'll not eat of it lest you die, but she added that you shall not touch it. Well, there's nothing really wrong with that, but where she's all of a sudden getting off of the word. Now, we don't want to split hairs about that, but Satan's looking for a crack in the door, so to speak, where he can get his little ugly, nasty toe in there and force his way into your life. And so he's suggesting right here, God really didn't say that, and he really didn't mean it. He is questioning the word of God, questioning the value, the honor, and the integrity of God's word. And see, that's where it all begins right there. That's where there's the root of unbelief and doubt in our life. When we get off of the word and we start questioning the word of God, and you say, well, do you believe in the infallibility of the word of God? Yes, I do. Do you believe the integrity of God's word? Yes, I do. And you say, well, there's a lot of contradictions in there. Well, no, there may be contradictions in our understanding. And believe me, I don't understand everything in the Bible, but I can tell you we need to settle that issue that what God said in his word is absolutely the truth. And that's what we build our life on. You know, we looked at it, I think, I don't know if we looked at it last time or not, but Hebrews chapter 6, it says, it is impossible for God to lie. Impossible. Why? Because God only speaks truth. But on the other end of that, Jesus said about Satan, he's the father of all lies, and there is no truth in him. So in other words, you've got absolute truth on one end, God, and then you've got absolute lying and deception on the other end, that's Satan. Now, which one are you going to believe? I mean, that shouldn't even, that, that should be a no-brainer for us right here. If Satan's saying it, it, there's some lies and deception in there somewhere. And I tell you, he's not going to appear to you, you know, like some of these figures, you know, a red being with a pitchfork and a fork tail coming out, and he's not going to jump out of the devil and you, you disobey God. He's not going to do that. He's going to subtly make suggestions and questions to your mind and he'll make those questions, suggestions uh, in, in the form of, it makes it almost like it's your own thought, where you're thinking this. And you begin to own that, you begin to dwell on that, you begin to entertain that, pretty soon it drops down your heart as a doubt and unbelief. Unbelief is beyond doubt. Doubt is just that seed thought that he plants, but unbelief in the heart is when we have a belief system that's contrary to what God said in his word. So uh, notice in verse number four, then it says, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. He's getting bolder now, you know, because he sees a little crack in the door right there where she may be confused or not really under remembering exactly what God said. So he's just coming on out and said, you will not surely die. He is just contradicting God himself. And then verse five, it says, for God knows then the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So in other words, what he's saying right here, he is he's moved from attacking the integrity of God's word. Now he's attacking and, and doing a character assassination on the heart of God towards us. He's suggesting to them subtly that God is withholding something good from them that would, that would make their life better. And see, there, he's, he's baiting them right here. He, he's actually accusing God of being something less than absolutely, perfectly, very good and loving toward us. So he says, God knows then that, uh, that, they, that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, there's a problem here. Now that he has suggested uh, doubts and questions about the Word of God, about the heart of God, now he's bringing it down to them. See, because once you lose sight and have a lot of doubts and questions in your heart concerning the character and nature of God and the integrity of God's word, then he's going to steal your identity. See, this is where identity theft began. It was in the Garden of Eden. This is not something new. You know, in the computer age, this is something that happened, and Satan's been doing this every Every, every time since, all throughout history, since the Garden of Eden. And he was successfully able to pull this off. Now notice, he says, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, 
they were already created in the likeness and the image of God. They were already created absolutely perfect and complete. There was nothing lacking in them. There was no reason for them to be dissatisfied and start looking somewhere else because God had absolutely made them perfect and everything was perfectly good. They were made perfectly good. All the creation at that time was made perfectly good. They were created in the likeness and the image of God. So now he's questioning who they are in their identity. Well, of course, we know the story that their behavior uh, reflected that questioning doubt and unbelief. You know, a lot of times we, we're trying to, to do behavioral uh, modifications, but we're, what we really need is heart transformations. We need to get down to the roots, down into our heart, to find out why people are behaving and doing the things they do. And see, if we're acting in unbelief, if we're not acting in faith, if we've got unbelief and doubts that are just negating and nullifying our faith, we need to get down to the roots of it, find out where they are. And I can tell you, it's probably in one of these categories right here. We've left the integrity of God's Word. We begin to question that. We begin to, to question God's character and nature and heart of goodness and love and grace toward us. And then third of all, and this will follow right on the heels of that, we'll begin to question who we are. We'll begin to try to find out what our identity is. And see, if our identity is not in God, it's going to be attached to something or someone out there. You have to identify with something or someone. But see, God intended for us to walk in identity in relationship with Him. Now, look over to the book of Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, because, Jesus, because Satan tried the same thing on Jesus, the last Adam. And we're going to see what happens here as we go through this narrative. But Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22 to begin with. It says, When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. It didn't say it was a dove, it just descended like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son. Now this is God speaking to him. Now he spoke supernaturally. Now Jesus didn't need that, but the people around did. Okay, It says, You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now notice those two words, you are. What does that mean? You are means this is your identity. This is who God had made him. He was in relationship with God as Father, Son. So he said, you are. He, said, he didn't say who well, you're trying to be. Hopefully you're going to make it. Hopefully you will become this someday. He said, you are. Now this is before, listen, this is before Jesus did anything good in the ministry. This is the onset of his ministry. And notice what God said to him. You are my, we, uh, he belonged to God, beloved son. Now, what does beloved mean? Beloved means the object of God's love and affection. So he said, you are my, uh, the object of my love and affection as my son. See, that's his identity right there. God just spoke his identity out right here, supernaturally. And he's, he goes on to say, in you, I am well pleased. And again, this is before he did anything in the ministry. See, a lot of times we're trying to do things in order to gain God's acceptance, in order to please God and, and get Him to favor us and earn some kind of favor or better benefit or blessing in our life. Well, that's not the, the, the way this operates right here. We, he was already pleased with Him because He was His beloved Son in identity. Now, notice how Satan, in the following chapter, attacks that identity. See, Satan's always going to attack you on the level and the basis of your identity. He's trying to steal your identity. So he says in verse number one, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and being tempted for forty days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when he was ended, he was hungry. And verse three says, and this is where Satan appears here, okay? And it says, And the devil said to him, If, now notice that word, if. Now we've already established, I think, the fact that if is the badge of doubt. So he's actually suggesting maybe there is a possibility you aren't this. All right, this is what he, he's lifting a question 
into Jesus in his mind. He said, if you are the Son of God. Well, we, it, well, God the Father just spoke, and Jesus already knew this, okay? He said, you are my beloved Son. He didn't say, well, if you do all this, then you are my Son. If you do this, you are this. No, nope. his identity was already established in what God had said to him. So he said, if you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Now, could Jesus do that? Well, absolutely. In fact, he multiplied loaves and fishes on at least two occasions that we know of, uh, re recorded in the Word of God. But should he have done that here? No, because he would be falling in line and taking his cues from the enemy. And he would actually be entering into this question and doubt of who he was, and he would be trying to gain some kind of physical evidence in order to prove himself and to find out that the Word of God was true. Boy, I tell you, that is so big right there. Because many times we're looking for physical evidence or physical feelings to affirm or confirm what God has already said to us or about us in His Word. And you know, the, the Bible, particularly in the New Testament, contains two lines of, of the Word of God. First of all, promises. We're well familiar with those. These are promises that God makes to you. But in order to have faith to receive the promises that He has made to us, we have to first of all, first of all be established and grounded in uh, what God said about us. And notice what God said about Jesus. He said, you are my beloved son. Jesus did not need physical evidence. He didn't need to do this to prove himself, to, him, to Satan or himself or anybody else, because he knew who he was. So notice how Jesus countered that in verse 4. And Jesus answered him, and uh, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. See, that is our spiritual food right there. That is food for your faith. See, if you want your faith to be strong and your doubts and unbelief to wither up and go away, then you need to feed that faith on the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So notice when, how do you counteract lies and deceptions from the enemy? By going back to the Word and establishing the truth of God's Word in your life. I tell you, Satan has no answer for that right there. That will counteract all his lies and shut him down in your life. It will shut his mouth quickly when you say, it is written. This is what God said, and this is what I believe. Well, that's all the time I've got for this lesson. We uncovered some really important truths today. We'll pick it up on the next lesson. If you'd like additional materials and resources, you can always visit us on the web, TonyCowan.org, and we'll see you in the next lesson. Hey guys, thank you so much for checking out this video. We hope that it really blessed you. Hope you got a lot out of it. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure you also turn on the notifications so that you get notified whenever we post a new video. Also, go ahead and hit that like button. And if God's doing awesome things in your life like we're believing Him for, then we would love for you to share that with us. So leave us a comment. Let us know all the good things God's doing in your life. We'll see you next time.